So I really wanted to spend some time today talking about, uh, about partnership. Um, as some of you may know, I recently left the University of Virginia where I have been for many years. I started graduate school there in 1997. Um, and I came back to be Chief Impact Officer at Teachstone largely because um, I was quite frankly frustrated by the pace of the work that I felt like I could do sitting in my office at the University of Virginia, even though, shout out to my colleague here from the University of Virginia, Anne, wherever she is, uh, lots of good work happening there. Um, but the thing that excites me most about this role is the opportunity to travel around the country and hear the stories about all of the work that you're doing. Um, and I think we've accomplished a lot together but I also think there's a lot more that we can do. So that's kind of the tenor of the conversation I want to have today. Um, so we'll talk today about this sort of vision that we have. Um, this vision of working to ensure that every child has access to life-changing teaching. I know that each and every one of you, I don't think it's a stretch, sort of shares that vision with us. So it's not just a teach stone vision, it's a vision that I think many of you hold. Um, and we've made great progress on that vision. Um, but I'm quite convinced, and I am more convinced now that I've been traveling around the country and around the world uh, over the course of the last few months, that we can do better. Um, and that I personally and we as a company are 100% dedicated to working with you to try to reach that vision more quickly and more adeptly. Um, and the reality is that we are never going to be able to do that alone. That's not something that happens in the offices that we have in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, or even for all of our staff who live across the country. It really happens in partnership um, with you. And um, like all great partnerships, we have many examples of success. Uh, and I heard about some I didn't even know about today. Um, but we also have challenges that we need to take on if we're truly going to create that vision. Um, I want to start with asking each of you just to take a moment to reflect on one thing, not that you took away from today, I thought about that, but I actually want you to reflect on one thing you've done in the past month, maybe the past three months, maybe the last year, that has really worked on that vision. What have you personally done yourself that has helped ensure that even a single child has more access to better teaching in the communities in which you work? Um, so you're going to have to share it. So <laughs> take a moment, write it down, um, and I'll give you about two minutes to just reflect and think about that. So one thing. It could be small. It could be big. Just one thing that you've done. All right, I feel like you all just have this in your head, I can tell. Um, all right, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. But I do want to just take a minute to return to this vision statement because um, it can sound kind of easy. Um, but just take a minute to imagine the communities in which you work. Uh, imagine what it would actually be like for every single infant, every single infant that is in your community who is in an out-of-care setting of some kind to enter a classroom every day in which their caregivers cared about them, but also that they were people who loved and understood the power of those interactions, those moment-to-moment -moment giggling, laughing, nonverbal and verbal interactions that are literally building babies' brains. And if every toddler had the opportunity to be with adults who understood that Toddlers don't misbehave. <laughs> Sometimes my four-year-olds, on the other hand, uh, they're a different story. But no, but that those that toddlers are the greatest because they're just trying to figure out how the world works, testing us in ways that drive us crazy, but so much fun. If every single toddler had that experience every day, and if every preschooler had the opportunity to interact in settings in which they were playing, and really playing, um, but also having rich opportunities to learn in interactions with their peers uh, and in interactions with teachers. 
uh, that every elementary student uh, experience the joy of learning, that excitement of breaking the code of literacy and of the natural world, that that was just the expectation. What would our kids look like by third grade if every single one of them from birth through third grade had that kind of experience? Just think about that. And we know the impact isn't just on our kids, right? Those of you who are parents or grandparents, imagine if you lived in a world where you just didn't have to worry. You could pick any child care center, any school, and you knew that those schools and the teachers in that setting would take care of your children and give them what they needed to succeed. Raise your hand, and I know I can do this because I know a few people. Raise your hand if you've actually had a child who was kicked out of child care, you personally, uh, your child or your grandchild kicked out of child care or elementary school for some reason. I have. My, second, my, my son, when he was two, was kicked out of child care for biting. Um, you'd think I would know how to find a good child care center, right? But I chose one that sounded good, and here, as you guys will appreciate this, it sounded good because she told me she was installing video cameras and I was going to be able to look in at any moment. Those cameras never got put up. Um, and I should have known things were wrong when I walked in one day uh, when he was about one and a half and they were all sitting at this table, like one of those tables where like you can't get out of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the teacher was asking them who the first president of the United States was. <laughs> <coughs> But I didn't, right? I didn't take him out of that setting. You know why? Because I had a full-time job and my husband had a full-time job and it was convenient. And I don't know. So just imagine like the collective decrease in blood pressure amongst the parents in this world. And like I say that and I know I'm totally privileged, right? Like I had the resources to be able to, when he got kicked out, to take a day off of work so that I could actually find another place to, to send him. And I got him into a Montessori school that transformed his life, right? So I'm privileged. And many of the parents that we all work with aren't so privileged. Um, so like the collective blood pressure reduction in the parents in this, in this world, if we really could trust that idea that it didn't matter uh, where we put our kids. Um, but think also of the teacher. So this is a not high resolution picture, but I just pulled it off of the Facebook page. Um, uh, Rita Baker, I forgot to look, is she here? Does anybody know Rita Baker from California? Uh, she posted from uh, a group of teachers who just finished their MMCI cohort um, from several counties in California. So imagine um, teachers who are really the lifeblood of the work that we do. Um, what would it mean if all of our teachers, whether they be Head Start, child care, family child care, state pre-K, uh, elementary school teachers, if they were earning the wages that they needed to earn and being given the supports they needed to give to provide the kinds of experiences that we know they want to be providing to their children. I mean, these teachers entered the workforce because they wanted to transform the lives of kids, right? That's why they're there. So imagine a world in which they could do that and they could stay so they weren't turning over and leaving their centers uh, to go take other jobs. If this was our reality, raise your hand if you're a, a leader, an assistant principal, a principal, a director of a program. So imagine a world in which you could just look at the resumes and be assured that teachers were coming to you with the skills they needed to prepare and work with the children in your setting. I could go on and on, right? Also, think about for all of us, what would it be like? I'd be out of a job. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, actually, I wouldn't, right? So we intentionally have focused on birth to third grade because we know there's so much work we need to be doing in that space. But what if we could turn those energies to what's happening in middle and high schools across this country? Because I spent a lot of time observing in those classrooms, too, and there's a lot of work to be done there, right? So it's, uh, there's a lot. Uh, is this an ambitious vision? Of course. Uh, is it easily achievable, even in a singular community? 
If I think of Charlottesville, Virginia, I can tell you it's absolutely not. We have so, so much work to do. Uh, this gap between sort of vision and reality is very, very large. We've started to talk about our work as a part of the opportunity gap, an opportunity gap that many others are talking about. Um, and Carter and Wellner wrote this really nice op-ed now several years ago and said, if we as a nation hope to narrow the glaring achievement gaps among children of different social classes, we must step up and provide low-income youth with a fair start. And we have to think seriously about the inputs. Now there's many, many inputs in that world, but we at Teachstone, we kind of like focusing on things. <laughs> um, and for us, our singular focus is around teacher-child interactions. And we get asked to do lots of other things, but we think that's a critically important input and one that we can really make, uh, make some movement and traction in, along with all of you. There's a recent study that really illustrated just how big this gap is. Um, so it was a study that followed a group of children in rural North Carolina and Pennsylvania. It actually followed them from birth, but this particular uh, paper that I'm referring to is a study of their experiences from kindergarten through third grade. Um, and they followed the children, they did class observations in all of their classrooms, um, and they looked at how many children actually had access to good teaching over the course of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. They actually weren't even looking for great teaching or life-changing teaching. They actually called it better teaching in the study. And it was defined entirely by th sort of thresholds on class. So they had to have a five on emotional support and classroom organization and a three on instructional port support. That was better teaching. Okay, test time. We're all educators. So answer this question for me. How many children do you think actually experience this sort of good enough or better teaching across all four years, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth, or sorry, third grade? If you read my blog post on this, don't cheat. Uh, all right, so how many people think 30%? Raise of hands. 20%? 10%? 5%? Less than 5%. Okay, those of you who had your hand raised just now, I won't say pat yourselves on the back because that's a little depressing. 4%, 4% of kids had access to this sort of good enough teaching across those years. 50% of the kids in that study actually had access to good, good enough teaching never or one year. Just think about that. The gap is wide. I've uh, been following a lot recently um, the work of, uh, of the Weave Project. Um, has anybody heard of this? Raise your hand if you've heard of this. David Brooks writes for the New York Times, uh, and he's written a few uh, sort of articles on this. Uh, and I've been really sort of compelled uh, in his writing and his talk about this as it, as it sort of relates to our work. Um, so I just want to read from, he calls it a manifesto. I want to read from his manifesto uh, about this work. He says, social fragmentation is the core challenge of our day. We long to be together, but we're apart. We are isolated by distrust, polarization, trauma, and inclivity. We live in a hyper-individualistic culture that pays lip service to community, but which actually values success above relationship, ego above care, the market above society, and tribal divisions over common humanity. The question for each of us is what can I do today and tomorrow to replace loneliness, division, and distrust with relationship, community, and purpose? Weave is a community of people who are helping each other answer this question. We seek to learn from those of you who are weaving communities everywhere who are establishing connections, building relationships, offering care, and creating intimacy and trust. We want to spread the values they live out every day. We want to be a part of a cultural revolution that replaces a culture of hyper-individualism with a culture of relationalism, a way of living that puts our connections with one another 
at the center of our lives. So I don't know about you, but I found this to be a sort of uh, incredibly powerful statement. And as I listened to it, I thought of many of the classrooms that I've spent time in over the course of, of my years doing this work that really embody that, where every child that walks into that classroom, you just know is going to be cared for um, and responded to, and that it's not even just about the teacher to the child, but it's about the children's interactions with each other. There's a lot of weaving happening in schools across the country, but as those data show us, there's a lot of places where that isn't happening. I also think of many of the teachers that I personally have coached or have gotten to know over the course of the year, many of whom work in real isolation from one another, but they long for community, connection, and trust. It's true for many teachers, but I think for those of us who work in early childhood, it's particularly true, right? How many of your teachers are the lone preschool teacher in a school building where they're not even invited to participate in the professional learning of the larger school in which they're a part of? Um, in our collective work, we've really seen examples of how the relationships that those coaches form or those teachers form with other teachers or with coaches can transform their teaching practice. I also think a lot of the communities that I've been so privileged to work with over the course of the past uh, four years as a part of the scale up of uh, pre-K in the context of Virginia, shout out to a few colleagues here in the, in the room who've been a part of that work. Um, you know, when we started that work, I would say that we were working at the beginning with 11 school divisions, at the end, uh, 13. Um, at the beginning, those school divisions were working in complete isolation from one another, not really aware of what was happening in communities that were just down the road, and certainly not communities that were on the other side of the state. And Virginia's not that big of a state, right? Uh, I grew up in California, so <laughs> like it's, it's doable. Um, but they just hadn't had opportunities to form any kind of a learning community where they could be sharing best practices and ideas about what high quality pre-K really looks like. Shout out to Norfolk, Virginia, our colleagues out there, and Marilyn Rice. Is Marilyn Rice in the room somewhere? Marilyn? Oh, she's going to get in trouble, although I did hear that a tree fell on her house and car today, so she might have an excuse for her. Uh, that's Marilyn. Did anybody go to Marilyn's session earlier today? Does she rock it? <laughs> Um, so over the past year across Virginia, school divisions across the country who have been, were lucky enough to be a part of VPI were able to share the practices they've learned with other school districts across uh, the Commonwealth. So this is an example of all the coaches and teachers who worked as a part of Norfolk who were really using the class as the heart of the improvement efforts that they were doing there. Um, so many other stories today of people weaving. So um, I hope you're not comfortable now because I am going to make you get up and move just for a minute. Sorry. I'll, I'll give you a pass if you can find somebody at your table that you don't know. But here's the problem. You all sat by people you know, right? Uh, you have to find somebody that you don't know. If you met them today, that counts. That's OK. You could talk to them. But I just want you to take that thing that you wrote down that one thing that you've done recently that's helped to do work in, the, in creating this vision and share it with somebody else. So I'm gonna give you five minutes. I want you to find somebody you don't know, tell them who you are, tell them what you do, and tell them what you've done, and then switch, and we'll come back, okay? Okay, I can tell we have many weavers in the room and you guys are ready to be out there weaving, uh, but you're gonna have to hold with me for a moment. I wish I could have captured all of those conversations. Um, okay, so uh, I think, um, you know, as we, as we do this work, 
It's important to think not just about the what, those things that you shared, but about the how. How do we accomplish those? And I guarantee you that for the vast majority of the things that you just described, you weren't doing them alone, right? You were doing them in partnership with somebody or some organization that helped enable you to sort of reach the kind of transformational change that you wanted to reach. So I just want you to take a minute. If you have your cell phone, get it out. You can actually go. Um, I want you just to think about either that thing that you did or something else. I want you to think about a partnership, whether it be professional or personal, where you've really enacted sort of transformational change. Something that you did not alone, but in partnership with a, another person or a community. And as you reflect on that partnership, I want you to write down three words that sort of describe why that partnership worked. So there are many words that we can use to describe partnership, but I'm going to end today by reflecting on three that I think have been important for me personally and for Teach Stone as an organization um, for this work to be successful. Um, those words are empathy, trust, and challenge. Let's start with empathy. So empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share the thoughts of feelings or others. Uh, there's actually great research by Ross Thompson at UC Davis and, and others who have done this work that just shows how early empathy starts. They do these crazy experiments where they like, you know, they have an experimenter who's climbing a ladder and they drop something and they see whether the toddler goes over to hand the thing to the, the experimenter. Um, so we know the seeds of empathy start very early. Maybe not quite that early, but it does look like it, doesn't it? Um, it's really in our human nature to be empathetic, but like all of these foundational skills, we also know that the seeds of that are in the experiences that young children have in the settings in which they work. So they need to experience empathy to be able to give empathy. Um, if I had to choose one place where we really need to be thinking of empathy today, uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, the people who are doing this work, right? Uh, this is a picture, I don't know if any of you recognize this, but there was an article in the New York Times a few, maybe six months or so ago about how our early childhood teachers are paid so little, right? So this is, is the teacher who the story was sort of about. Uh, there, there can be a way in which sometimes when, I, I realize when I'm talking about this work or we're talking about this work, it can sound like teacher blaming. Um, and I, I think it's important for us to be really careful and deeply empathetic uh, to the teachers doing this work. Um, I started as a teacher, you heard today Bob started as a teacher. We know that our teachers are being asked to do a lot. Um, and I think for us to close the gap, we really need to lean in. I, I love the example Bob gave today, I didn't actually know this, that early on he was spending a day a week actually in classrooms talking to teachers. Um, we need to lean in and make sure we're empathizing with them. Interestingly though, you know, research actually shows that too much empathy can be a problem. How many of you know teachers who have dropped out of teaching because they over empathize with the children with whom they work and they feel demoralized and depressed and burnt out? Um, and I imagine many of you who are coaches experience something similar in working with teachers and feeling frustrated at the end of the day that you can't sort of help them in the ways that they need to be helped. Oh, someday I'm gonna get this right. So research actually describes that there are three kinds of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, which is the ability to understand how a person feels and what they're thinking. Obviously important for us. Emotional empathy is the ability to share the feelings of another person. Some have described it as your pain in my heart. Uh, those of you who know the class, you can sort of see elements of both of these in the work that we do. Um, but it's really probably the third kind of empathy that is most important. That's called compassionate empathy or empathetic concern, where we really move beyond just trying to understand and we start to take action. So I think it's this compassionate empathy that's a starting place for the kinds of partnership work that we need to do. That leads me to the next word that I chose, which was trust. 
a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. Uh, as I was preparing for this talk, I came across a great blog post by a woman who's a CEO and founder of Principal Design, um, whose focus and work is on the potential of technology and innovation to reimagine the way we live and interact with each other. Um, and she was pointing out another limit of empathy and why we have to move towards trust. I'm just going to read what she said. She said, at best, empathy allows for an understanding of where the other stands and their circumstances. At worst, it allows for a smug feeling of care and engagement. But in both cases, there's nothing at stake. You can walk away at any moment and retreat to the safety of your life while having that fuzzy feeling of, of being enlightened. We're constantly told that empathy will make us better people and better businesses, but it's really only half the answer. And then she goes on to talk about the importance of trust and how we need it more. And she ends by saying, trust is transactional. Empathy only requires uh, a single passive person to feel for something or someone. But trust requires a willing vul vulnerability on both sides. Trust is earned by one person from another. And that relationship demands agency, freedom, reason, emotion, and of course, time. This also really resonated with me. Um, you know, it's important for our teachers to be empathetic for children, but it's far more important that they, that the child feels trusted uh, and that the child is trusting of the, ch of the teachers with whom they work. A little plug here, I'm going to be talking tomorrow about an intervention called Banking Time that focuses exactly on that, supporting teachers for their relationships with children with whom they're struggling. Um, really, really critical. Um, unfortunately, I would argue that too few of our children really feel trusted. I know my 12-year-old will recount daily the ways he does not feel trusted in the school in which he's working. Um, and I actually think the voices of our children probably can do a better job of explaining this than any class scores. So I'm going to take you on a little journey uh, and read you a story written by a first grader of a friend of mine. He was asked to write a nonfiction story, and he wrote a story called First Grade Facts. Are we ready? OK. I don't have this on here, so I have to read it. But you guys can. First Grade Facts. How to, first of all, I love first grade. Inventive spelling is like the best. Isn't it the best? OK, how to listen to the teacher. One, sit down. Two, look at the teacher. Three, do what the teacher says. <laughs> Next page. Sometimes you have to do tests. Next page. Sometimes you have to start over. <laughs> Next page. You have to listen. Next page. Children have to do their work every day. Next page, my favorite. Children do not roll in the classroom. <laughs> uh, teachers get very mad if you don't do your work. So do your work. Teachers are the best if you listen. OK, so I'm not teacher blaming, right? There's a lot that goes into it. And those of you who have taught first grade know the kinds of demands and pressures that those teachers are under. But is this the kind of experience that we want? Our, is this what we want them to think of when they think of first grade facts? Um, so too few children are trusted. And apparently, in Charlottesville, you can't roll in first grade. I just love that. Um, so I, I think, and I'm totally biased, of course, but I think actually the class has a critical role to play here. If we come back to this definition of trust, a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something, my experience is, and, and you can tell me better, better uh, in your own settings, but I think for teachers and programs who've really developed a trust in the class, as a fair assessment, an objective assessment of their practice, as opposed to somebody just coming in and telling them what they're doing sort of out of nowhere, 
um, that it provides an opening for conversation about change in a way that other experiences that they've had don't. Um, but for our work to succeed, that idea of trust requires that we're collecting data with accuracy and fidelity. And that's something that I've been paying a lot of attention to and um, many of my colleagues who couldn't actually come to interact because they're out collecting data across the state of Virginia and in Washington, D.C. right now, we're paying really serious attention to what we can do to help ensure that we're giving you what you need to be able to collect high quality class data. All right, so the final word that I will focus on today is challenge. Challenge, being faced with something that needs great mental or physical effort in order to be done successfully and therefore tests a, a person's ability. So I think when challenge is paired with empathy and trust, that's sort of Vygotsky, right, Bob? That's where we really start to see the power and the possibility of change. Um, and I'm going to argue that, that the challenge of our sort of collective work is how can we use the class to first develop that sort of shared vision of what great teaching is, but then to look deeply at ourselves and our practice and ask what are we doing to enact effective classroom teaching and what are we doing to block that? And how can we sort of sit together and partner with e each other to help ourselves reflect in that space? So across the country, teachers are sitting with coaches, coaches are sitting together, challenging ourselves to, you know, I mean, 4%, right? 4%, there's a lot of work to do. So there's a lot of challenge ahead. Empathy, trust, and challenge. Uh, I think they've helped build all the partnerships that exist. I hope for those of you who are newer to this work that there's many opportunities ahead for us to develop partnerships with you. Um, Dominique McCain, is she in the room? Dominique? She's not. So Dominique McCain came and spoke to a group of our revenue team um, when we were in Dallas a few months ago. And she called us out on this. She's like, you are, you know, I am not a customer. I am a partner, um, and I expect you to act like a partner. And we are deeply, deeply committed to that work, and I, and I hope that you feel that. And so I, at the end, I just want to talk about a few things that we're doing as a company um, to continue to work in this space of partnership. Um, if, I, if I start with, sorry, if I start with empathy, um, I have to say, at times our, our work can feel a little sterile. Like there are days when I'm at the office and basically the tenor of my conversations are things like, should programs get a 3 or a 3.25 or a 4 on instructional support or how many observers do we need to collect 900 observations over three months with double coding 10% of the data? Um, how do we get 20,000 users onto the MyTeachStone system without totally imploding the whole system? So we, as an organization, I think can get pulled away from our, our I think, natural inclination towards empathy. Uh, but there are several steps that we're taking in that space today. Um, first, uh, we've just hired a new chief revenue officer. That's the person in our organization who oversees the uh, sales team. Uh, and her name is Letta. Letta Simon, are you here? Where? Ah, Letta. Uh, can you stand up just for a minute? Now you can come and give your talk, Lada. No, no, I'm joking. Um, I, so when we started searching for a, a CRO, I, I think I had Lada in my brain, and it was sort of like, we can't achieve that. Like, we can't really find a person like that. Um, and I am so privileged that we found her. So she has an incredibly... Um, deep background in early childhood, and most recently she's actually been running Head Start and early child care programs for the Y in Central Maryland. I think actually the day she came for her interview, she had like just gotten her class federal monitoring scores back, right? So she has lived and breathed this work uh, like many, many of you. Um, She's also engaged in a number of other leadership positions, most notably as president and CEO of Brightside Academy, so on the childcare side of the work, where she led the expansion and operations of Head Start into three states. Um, so it is just a deep honor to have somebody like Leda working with us. And 
Um, I think she will know and understand your experiences and bring them back to our team in a way that I think will really help us uh, do our work better. Um, this year we've also placed a real emphasis on equity. Some of you have been a part of sessions related to that today, and there's a lot of work going on in that space. But I want to highlight one set of work happening that I'm really excited about. So since the beginning of the use of class in Head Start, there have been lots of questions about the use, particularly in tribal communities. And we've been a part of conversations sort of peripherally and sporadically, but we really decided that we needed to take on that challenge and own it a little bit more. So over the past few months, we've gathered a tribal advisory council to help us better understand the needs of the tribal communities. Um, and we had a, a team meet with a bunch of folks out in Albuquerque, and we've had several calls, and are, we'll continue the conversations. The conversations are, quite frankly, hard at times. Conversations about what does child development look like in these contexts, and how does the class align or not align with their vision of what of what sort of adult interactions should look like. They're not easy conversations, but we really are deeply committed to the work and are actually um, really feeling privileged that one of the communities, uh, uh, the Choctaw committee, community in Mississippi has invited us to come uh, and we have some, Campbell is going out to collect some video footage. So we'll have better video representation of their programs in our video, um, in our video library, but importantly, um, and this was very important to them in our conversations. It's not like we're just going and getting video and leaving. It is the beginning of a conversation uh, that we're really excited about. All right, so trust. Um, we founded Teachstone on the idea that you could trust the programs and products and services that we were giving. We weren't just selling things, right? That was the idea of Teachstone, Touchstone. Hopefully people get that. Um, <laughs> We really are committed to doing things that work. Um, and when we started this work, it was largely about scaling evidence-based programs, so things we sort of developed in the lab at UVA and then taking them to the field. Um, and, and from the very beginning, we realized that we would need help. We'd need to develop an affiliate network and, and, and partnerships and colleagues. Um, but I think we've made some mistakes along the way. And we're working to fix those. And I would say one of them has to do with this issue of trust. And it really is a bi-directional issue. But I think we haven't trusted the people in this room enough, right? We worried so much about the quality and fidelity and implementation that at times we lost sight of the true capacity and power that sits in a room like this and rooms across the country to do this work and drive towards that collective vision. Um, you know a lot about the communities in which you work that we know nothing about. Uh, Emily Doyle, who is the sort of mastermind behind the development of our community. Raise your hand if you're a part of the community. Um, if you're not, sign up in the lounge. Uh, and also the mastermind behind Interact has taken over the affiliate program and is bringing a sort of new lens and novel thinking to how we can work together. Uh, to best achieve our collective vision. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm not here to explain any major changes. But I, I can tell you this, that for those of you who want to go out and collect class data, um, we'll make sure that you have the tools and services that you need to do that and collect it well. For those of you who want to use the class as the backbone of your improvement efforts, through professional development, coaching, online learning. We want to make sure that you have the tools and supports you need to do that. As we do that work, we're also going to re-engage in our efforts to make sure that we can assess impact, right? Um, because that's the sort of other side of trust. The reason I think sometimes we haven't trusted enough is because we worry that things won't have the same impact if they're not delivered with fidelity, right? And, but I think if we do a better job of capturing what success actually looks like and measuring it, then we can hold each other mutually accountable for success and for impact. So more to come on that. All right, one last thing before cocktails. Uh, I'm going to explain a sort of joint challenge for us. We want all of our kids to have great teaching. I, I as a parent, certainly want that for my kids. Um, Life-changing teaching would be awesome. Uh, but the reality is, if we're going to make substantive progress on this sort of shared vision, 
we have to take seriously the challenge of what it takes to get more children, many more children, 96% of children, just good enough teaching. And that's a little, it's like depressing just to say, like imagine if our vision statement was ensure that every child has good enough teaching, right? It doesn't sound very good, but we really, I think, need to work towards that. We know that it matters. So in that same study that followed those kids, we saw that children who experienced good enough teaching for four years were actually doing better academically at the end of it, particularly for those kids who started low in their literacy levels. So good enough really can be good enough. And I worry sometimes that too many of our resources flow into turning the good to great, right? It is in voluntary QIS the best programs that sign up. It is the coaches who kind of want to be coached. We actually have data on this. The, the sort of coaches who uptake, co or the teachers who uptake coaching the most are actually those who start out with the highest class scores, right? There's always a need for excellence, and I'm not giving up on a vision of life-changing teaching, but we do have to challenge ourselves collectively to put more resources into turning the really not good to good. Taking on teachers, programs, schools that really need to fairly radically change their practice. And I would argue that's kind of different work than the work of turning good to great. And I know some of you in this room are engaged in that work and I'd love to hear it. I feel like we need to have a whole track focused on that next year, which is how do you work with really low performing teachers and schools and programs and, and get that transformational change. Um, and then to end, I would just say that we at TeachStone are always open to being challenged. Uh, we might not always respond in the way that you want. <laughs> we can't do everything, um, but we will certainly listen and do our best. Um, so if you have a challenge for us, for me, talk to me, let me know that. Reach out to the person um, in this organization with whom you do have a partnership and, and let us know, because it's really, we want to be challenged to do the hard work. Um, we know that reaching this vision that we have isn't going to be easy, and if we do it, we're, we're ultimately going to do it together. Um, so with that, uh, I, I'm going to do this first and then uh, open it up to questions. So at the end of his relational manifesto, David Brooks says, when things are going well, there's a process weaving from the bottom to the top. When relationships are forming well, microscopic neural networks weave together in the brain. Individual personalities weave together and are made stronger. Families weave tight bonds and are made more resilient. Neighborhoods become mo more coherent, towns more vibrant, regions more prosperous, prosperous, peoples more confident, nations more just, and the world more harmonious. Some people in this vast web weave in ways that are small and modest. Others launch programs that are epic and heroic. But it's all part of the same self-reinforcing process of weaving. Everyone can play. So thank you for being here, playing with us. And I look forward to continuing to play with you over the course of the next years. Um, Aaron, I don't know if we have questions. So if you guys do have questions, post them in the Whova app. Liz posted it under Partnering for Impact Keynote. We do have one question from Emily. Emily Doyle. <laughs> um, earlier today, you mentioned the applicability of class in the context of gymnastics coaching. <laughs> Are there other contexts we should more seriously consider extending a class lens to that you would prioritize if you could, such as after school or parenting? Mm. Emily, thanks for tossing me that one. Do you, <laughs> you know, it's very funny. I can't tell you the number of contacts that I've had over the years about this. Everything from, I actually had a medical res, the person who ran medical residency at UVA wanted to come and do MTP for residents. I had this like business professor guru who wanted us to like start filming one-on-ones between leaders and their uh, teach and their uh, staff members. So I think that certainly, I mean, all we're doing is measuring interactions, right? They are, they're universally 
I won't say universal, they're applicable to a lot of the world. On the flip side, I think we are trying to be very focused. I think Emily points out if we were going to invest uh, and sort of expand, after school is one that makes a whole lot of sense. And the other one, and I imagine there are people in the room who are already doing this, is families, right? Especially in home visiting, ways in which you could sort of use the class in that context. So these are ideas we talk about on a regular basis around at Teach Joan, and so continue to challenge us and we'll try to figure out how to make it happen. Probably partnerships are gonna be key to having that happen.